everyone, I hope that you had a great weekend. Today I want to talk to you about one of my favourite books. If you watched my video where I talked about my favourite books of last year, and indeed the video where I talked about my favourite books of the last five years, then you will be familiar with this book here, which is English Animals by Laura Kay. I absolutely adored it, and so I wanted to sit down with Laura and talk to her about the book. What I didn't realise before I read it is that Laura is a filmmaker, and when I found that out afterwards, it suddenly made so much sense to me because I never picture characters when I read a book. I kind of get a blurry idea of what they might be like, but it's more a sensation, a feeling, than picturing their appearance. But when I read this book, I really felt like I could picture not only the scenes, but the people very vividly and was imagining, was imagining what actors could play those roles. And I really do think that her experience in filmmaking has meant that the way she has written these characters and their surroundings, the way we view them is specific to that and works so brilliantly. So this is actually an episode of my podcast, which is called Books with Jen. This is the uh, icon for the podcast here. If you would prefer to download this episode to listen to when you're out and about, then you can do so at the links I'll leave in the description box down below. Alternatively, alternatively you can just leave this video playing and it will fade to the podcast logo and it will just be an audio file and you can listen to us having a chat. It was lovely to sit down with Laura and talk about this book. We talk about Englishness and divides, language, we talk about the countryside, all of the themes that are in her book and filmmaking as well. The first question that I asked her when we sat down was how she thought film had influenced the way that she writes, so that's the first question that she's going to answer. If you would like to support this podcast, you can do so by liking, sharing this video, and also by supporting me on Patreon, which is a place where you can tip your favorite creators. I'll leave a link to that in the description box down below as well. I think that is everything that I wanted to say. I think so. There are 20 other episodes of this podcast to catch up on as well if you want to dive into the backlist. Again, links in the description box. I'm going to be quiet now and hand you over to the interview and I hope that you enjoy it. I've actually uh, worked solely in documentary, mm -hmm. so um, I haven't written or worked on feature films. Um, but I do think there is there are lots of interesting things that writers can, make to, can learn from filmmakers, yeah. both in you know, in all senses, and I think it comes down to editing and storytelling again, like, they, they all thrive on the same things. Um, so I think it has been really useful to my writing. You learn this when you're making a documentary sequence, and we call them sequences, and then it's like you've got to have a bit of them filming, and then you've got to have them from a reverse angle, and you learn this kind of weird language, and if you don't get those things, then it makes the edit really difficult, because you don't have those shots. But it means that you sort of learn that you can cut from one thing to the other without having to move them physically mm -hmm. around or just things like that that I think change the way your brain works. Yeah. I'm not sure if they've helped me draw characters so well. Yeah. But I think certainly thinking about um, scenes and sequences and settings and things like that, I think it yeah, definitely helps. That's really interesting because I'm you know, on a much lower scale but filming YouTube videos, if I film something... Um, not in my house, so out somewhere and I filmed a situation. I learnt the hard way that you need that B footage for when you need to explain something or whatever, when you're panning, when you when you have a voiceover. And I guess that's the same with books. You need enough uh, scene setting and things to occupy a character if they're looking out, but also talking to you about what they're thinking. What are the documentaries that you have worked on? Um, so mostly music. Um, I joined the BBC music department in... 2006 and then just sort of stayed there getting job after another um, because I studied, I, d I did Spanish and Portuguese at university mm. and my dissertation was on Brazilian music and so I sort of wrote to the BBC and made out that I was a world expert in, Bra yes. <laughs> in Brazilian music um, and they, it was like the luckiest thing that ever happened to me, they were commissioning a documentary on Brazilian music at that time and I was trying to work in TV. Anyway, they gave me the job and I stayed. So I did the most amazing um, music documentaries over the world, things on um, elect the birth of ele electronic music in Britain, um, German music of the kind of 60s, Latin USA, which so it was all about the birth of salsa, um, bossa nova, 
um, quite a lot of world music things because I speak Spanish and Portuguese. Mm. So, I've, yeah, it was really um, great. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> so there's so many different things. And also you're talking about, um, we just spoke about learning how to tell storytelling in a different way through film. But that's also storytelling through music and dance. One day I'll write a novel about it as well. I do mm. find that kind of like, when you're with this little band of travellers and kind of travelling around, I think that experience of it has been really great as well. You've written some um, shorter non-fiction pieces about travelling around, haven't you? In the summer after I got my... Um, I found out English Animals was going to be published. I took a month off and went travelling around um, the southwest USA and I wrote some pieces about travelling alone and I walked, I hiked the Grand Canyon and I d- went to all these national parks and went hiking on my own and drove around on my own. So I wrote a bit about that, but I, that was the best holiday I've ever been on. I loved it. I Can loved you share it. any key experiences from that? Um, well, I think... First of all, overall, it was just... I hadn't had this experience since I was a teenager of not planning something. Because when you're working, you're so... Your holidays are so precious that, you know, the, the idea that something might go wrong... Or I didn't really have very many holidays because of the nature of TV. So I didn't plan anything until the day when I woke up, you know, and then I was like, where shall I go today? And then I found a motel. And just that experience was just so... I don't know just magical and really I just felt so free so that it was that that made it so special and secondly the landscapes in that part of the world are just like Utah I I went up at sunset to this um place called Valley of the Gods and I was on my own and I just sat on the sort of bonnet of my car and it was just the like most beautiful place I've ever Mm. seen and nobody really nobody was there and yeah, things like that. They were, yeah, the scenery there is vast in a way that we just do not have here. No, it makes you realise how tame England. You know, like in England, I love, I love walking, and so I can set out from my parents' house in about six different footpaths and just walk, and I'm never afraid of anything, mm. and I don't have to worry about any animals. And suddenly, when you're walking in America in the national parks, you you know you always see this sign where it's like what to do if you see a bear and what to do if you see, I don't know, all these like snakes and rattlesnakes and and suddenly you think, God, our countryside is so benign in comparison. It is. When my husband and I went to um, Japan on our honeymoon, we walked past these signs that said, beware of bears. And we went, oh, of course there's no bears here. That's just an, like an exaggeration. I'm sure there aren't any bears. And when we got back to our hostel, we Googled it and then wished we hadn't. <laughs> it's all about these maulings. <laughs> you thought, okay, well, we'll not go up that path again then. But yeah, we get complacent. Um, uh, yeah, we are very, very lucky here. Um, so what story did you want to tell with English animals? That's a very big question. Where did you begin with English animals? Is probably a better question. Um... Well, English animals came from sort of various sources, various ideas that I had sort of separately and then pieced together or I found the key to, to telling it. And really I wanted to tell a story of of a gay character who was living in the countryside uh, in this quite kind of... I don't really come from exactly the same background as the people in English animals, but I I have grown up with people sort of a bit like that. And I was very conscious of the kind of customs and the prejudices and I don't know, I just found that kind of area and very, you know, fruitful to think about and very exotic in a way, you know, for someone who's lived in London for all my adult life. Mm. Um, And I tried to write a book about London and it just didn't go very well. And then I sort of got, I thought, oh no, I really want to look back at kind of like this English rural life. Mm. And the initial thing was that I was going to write about Sophie, the character, and who was... uh, I actually... This came from... Quite a lot of it came from dating. So I met met a woman dating who had married a man very young and gone to, like, live in this country house and secretly she knew she was gay and she would sneak up to London and eventually... And she was trying for a baby. It was all very... And then eventually left him and, you know made it and went up to London lived there and was gay Mm. um but I was kind of interested in that but then I just don't know what what it was about Sophie I couldn't really write it from her perspective and then I met um a woman who then became Mirka Mm. and and that just fitted in everything that I wanted to say and 
explore and so I wrote it from her perspective. So for those who haven't read English Animals yet, could you give a, um, a quick elevator pitch as to what the book is in its current form? Yeah, so the story is about Mirka, who's from Slovakia, and she's living in London, and um, she gets a job uh, to be an au pair, but there are no children, um, at a country house. It's not really a state, but it's just a, a crumbling kind of big house where this sort of sh- shambolic... English couple live who sort of commandeer her to help in various businesses that they run. They've got a and b and they've got a taxidermy business. But anyway, she um, becomes a taxidermist and helps Richard in his business, who's the husband. And then she I falls in love with Sophie. I hope that's not, I don't think that's too big a spoiler. Um, and then it's kind of just about this love triangle and her finding, exploring what her place is in the world and whether she belongs there. It explores lots of themes, homophobia and xenophobia and kind of it's a pre-Brexit novel, I think. Yeah, so what? when did you write this? I wrote this in 2013, so okay. way before... Because it feels very now. <laughs> I wish that wasn't true, but it, but it does. Yeah, I mean, it was published after Brexit, but I wrote it before. And there is a character in particular who's Sophie's dad, who's called William, who I didn't hadn't heard of Jacob Reese mogg back then. But oh my God, it's him! <laughs> it's him. He's he's definitely not physically what I imagine, but no. he's kind of that same vibe of always talking about sovereignty and this idea of. Britain and what it should be and he's always always talking about it and he's very sort of he's very prejudiced against Mirka for being foreign and he's also very homophobic and just really not a very nice piece of work but very real to me like I know those people also what's interesting with him is that he seems to think she must also agree with him that Mirka must also know that and accept that as a fact if she's going to be around him he doesn't try and hide it at all no I mean he's just he doesn't he doesn't care at all. He's he's just the ultimate patriarch. I mean, I don't think I'd put anything in there about PC culture, but, you know, he's the sort of guy that bangs on about how PC culture is ruining... I think I did actually put that in. I think there's a little <laughs> bit about it at the party. Yeah. Um, but it's more hinted at than anyone talking about it yeah. deliberately. It's just it's just that they're so unaware. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, very old, sort of old-fashioned. Um, so can we talk about some of the themes in this? So a way that you illustrate off those points brilliantly is through Mirka learning English. She already speaks English, but she comes to understand, I suppose, the certain ticks of the English language and the way that people talk to her. At the beginning, when people come to the house to deliver certain things, she thinks that they're being really nice to her or polite, and then she, um, as, it, as we go through the novel with her, she discovers they're actually being quite passive-aggressive, and they're playing with English <laughs> languages in a way that she just didn't notice. It's such like an English thing to be that passive-aggressive about things. Um, and Sophie um, plays a crossword with her every morning, and through that she kind of starts to pick up on clues as to what people are trying to say to her. Um, so how did you... Um, go about exploring language in that way. Is language very important to you? You mentioned that you spoke lots of different languages yourself. Speaking different languages makes me realise, made me think about how I would represent her language. I spent a whole day at the British Library. I found, for some reason, a P- someone's PhD thesis on linguistic mistakes that the Slovakian or Eastern, I can't remember if it was Slovakian, but one, make in English, mm-hmm. the common mistake, grammatical yeah. mistake. And I was reading it and I was thinking, I really don't need to do this. Like, it doesn't matter if I'm right or wrong in exactly what mistakes she makes. I just need to create my own language for her. I didn't want her to sound unintelligent. I, you know, didn't want it to be as a language that was somehow not rich. But I just set myself a bunch of rules. And one of them was uh, not to use any idioms. Mm. And, you know, when you learn Spanish, you learn all the equivalent idioms that we have. And they're always so weird. Like what? <laughs> um, oh, God. Um, well, oh God, I'm going to struggle to think of a single thing in Spanish now. But, you know, in English, like, the more you think about anything we say and you try and take that out of our language, you realise we use them all the time, rolling your eyes or keep your eyes peeled. Mm. And that, I mean, keep your eyes peeled is so weird. And gross. And gross. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I wanted, I wanted to remove them and then and then I just thought of because I was thinking about them so much that's how I thought of the crossword I can't do crosswords at all Mm. so um 
I just had a bit of fun kind of like putting them back in through the crossword and it just made a nice counterpoint between the two and it's like they have their own secret language as well yeah right? yeah um, and what I also admire about that is that um, Sophie's father is claiming that if we're talking about learning English is that thing of speaking properly I'm using air quotes so you can't say speaking properly and he thinks that they they have that their heritage is speaking properly that um, that that is the way things should be done but actually the way they're discussing um, their surroundings is very much outdated and Mirka's language is much more relevant than theirs is, even if they think she's not being, air quotes again, proper. Um, so where did taxidermy come from? <laughs> um, uh, that came just from an in, an interest. Um, I read this beautiful book called The Breathless Sioux, mm. um, which is an academic book about uh, different types of taxidermy and it just made me think I it's something you know you know that's around and you've seen it but you've never especially in East London where it was like very trendy circa 2012-13 I think um, and I just read this book and it was kind of talking about how you know if you taxidermy a zebra for, and bring it back to people that have never seen a zebra mm. that's different to chopping off the head of a deer and making it into taxidermy and putting it on the wall to say I killed this deer, mm-hmm. which is also different to uh, preserving your pet. And, and it's just about... All, and I just became really fascinated with it. And um, so I did a course, very short course. I did a, a taxidermy to mouse, which was... It was disgusting and also not as bad as I thought it was going to be. The guy next to me just had blood everywhere, but I managed to keep mine really neat, um, which I think is what you're supposed to do. Um and there were all these things about animals that I started getting interested at the same time. So uh, there was taxidermy and then there was just the idea of... Because I knew that I wanted to have it in a hunting mm. and shooting uh, s- sort of scenario because that go- where, where my parents' village is, that goes on around us. And I'm often walking the dog and I'll bump, bump into a shoot. And I just so- started thinking, it has never occurred to me to want to go and kill a bird for fun. I'm, I wasn't a vegetarian I am now, but still, even if I ate meat, like the idea of doing it for sport is I was suddenly like, what a weird thing to do. And then I just thought about that a lot more. So that was a theme that kind of comes through in the book. And um, uh, yeah, the kind of just our relationship with sort of animals and how we relate to them. Um, there was something I was really interested in. Well, I think it feeds beautifully into everything else that you're talking about because that hunting, the predatory nature, some some of the characters are like that with regard to Mirka and other characters in the book. And then preservation, I suppose, Mirka's trying to preserve herself and um, uh, they're trying to preserve their outdated culture. So, yeah, no, I think it's great. I was wondering, I should have asked you before we started recording this, sorry, whether you would mind reading a little extract. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Which you book? Have, no, any, take your pick. Um, yeah, I can just, shall I just do the beginning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> I apologise for having a little bit of a cold and sounding a bit um, coldy, but it's not too bad. Um, I will start... So this is when she arrives... Um, She arrives into the house. The first thing I saw were the dead animals. They were everywhere on the walls, some in glass boxes, some not. Their eyes seemed to stare directly at me. Next to the door was a white owl with bright yellow eyes landing on a branch with her wings open. Then there were two squirrels eating nuts inside a glass box. Then another box with a blackbird inside picking up a worm from the earth in its beak. There were all kinds of birds, some foreign and colourful, some more English-looking brown ones, lots of mice and rabbits, a few small long animals like the ones used for making fur coats, and a big grey animal with a black and white stripy face. I felt something powerful from them. They were not decorations like lamps. They had been breathing animals full of flowing blood, and now they lived together in a zoo of death, watching the people who came in and out of the house. I walked towards the fox inside a big glass box on the wall opposite the door, When I arrived at the glass, I felt that the fox had heard my steps and froze. Her head was turned towards me like she was listening. I stared at her. She was amazing. I had never been so close to a fox in my life. She had rich orange fur and a white chest. There was a bird between her teeth, and she looked at me with suspicious eyes, as if she thought I was going to steal the bird. 
The artist had made a beautiful natural home for the fox to live in. The back of the box was painted blue for the sky, and her black feet were walking on the grass with rocks and moss and ferns. She seemed so alive, but I knew she was dead, and if I looked at her forever, she would look at me forever too, but she would stay the same, and I would grow old. My hair would grow long and grey. Lines would cut into my face. My skin would become loose, until one day I would fall to the ground and turn to dust in front of the eyes of the fox. Wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what has the experience of releasing this book into the world been like? Um, it's been really amazing in lots of ways. Um, I've met so many interesting people. Um, I sort of, I, I don't know, little things crop up, like uh, I'm teaching a workshop in Berlin next week. You yes, know. I saw that. That's very exciting. Things like that. Like, they're just so, such a joy and privilege to do. So there's lots of things like that are amazing. Um, and I've met nice writers one thing it has taught me is that it doesn't make a second book any easier. No, no it doesn't. So, um, that really has been so hard and trying to juggle work and writing a second book and abandoning many drafts. I, I don't know. I just thought that maybe second time around it would be easier, but that I realise I've been taught a lesson that it's really not going to get easier, I don't think, any time. No, my friend Kirsty and I were talking about this. We think it's like childbirth. You forget how difficult it is, so you think, I'll do it again. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're in the middle of it and you're thinking, oh, shit. Yeah, it's, it, it's weird because you sort of send it out into the world and you just don't know what's going out or mm. on. Like, you don't know if people are reading it or what they think of it. I mean, you do get little bits, but not that much. No. And that's quite strange. So how far are you into the second one? And is there anything you can tell us? Two weeks. Two, you're two weeks into writing it? <laughs> yeah. I oh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm no, right. no, no, it's fine. <laughs> I abandoned... I've been... I wrote one last year, and I tried to say... I just kept doing new drafts of it, kind of trying to save it, and then I just mm. realised was, it was just getting worse and worse and worse, and then before Christmas I was like... I hate it. <laughs> and then, so I've started a new one and it's going much better, actually. Um, so, yeah, fingers crossed, we'll see. Well, also, the old one, it might come back in another form at some point. Nothing is lost, right? No, there's definitely bits of it that are, yeah, they will, they will pop back in it, but it just wasn't, like, the right container for mm. it to me. Yeah. And because you work with film, have you thought about the potentially changing this into, or would you like to turn this into film oh very much but it is it, it is happening it is ha- i'm so excited yeah oh my I, goodness, sorry i just sort of kind of I, squealed <laughs> i'm so i'm more excited about this than i mean it's not definitely going to happen but um well, all of these things are always you know yeah but you've got to celebrate them i am it li- might not happen, I, yeah. I mean i'm so overjoyed that someone wants to make this into oh, a it film is. and it's yeah i will be thrilled can but. i make a suggestion for richard because i know that like my opinion is really oh it'd be important. really interesting to see if it's the same as ours dominic west yes yeah. oh really really that is our well that's my <laughs> mine anyway we we do talk about fantasy casting all the time but dominic west would be really good he would be the one. wait there's two dominics uh, i'm thinking of dominic west who's in Pride. the fair and in he was recently in yeah. the BBC Les Mis. He would be he would be really good. But the there's not the is Dominic the Cooper as well is actually quite good. Is he a lot younger? He's a lot younger, but he's actually probably the same age as Richard now. Oh really? Okay. But Dominic West would be great. Um, Dominic West was who I was imagining it when I was reading it. He I could just I didn't know it's that swarthy was. kind of oh, yeah. yeah brown curly hair thing yeah both yeah all those that he would be brilliant. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is a long way off. Like, at the moment, they've um, been given a bit of funding and the script's being written. Okay. And there's a director. At the end of an interview, I always ask uh, authors what they've read recently and loved and would recommend to people. Oh, I just read Ghost Wall. Sarah. I thought it was just so brilliant. (laughs) I was just so jealous. (laughs) But just, like, it's so good. It is Um, so good. I loved it. And and it's... Some of it's similar territory I think yeah it is um, borders and divides and yeah. Englishness and all of that so, yes, yeah. yeah I thought it was so fantastic I loved it um, yeah yeah no it's a very good recommendation I second that uh, we are going to disappear and uh, eat some apple turnover <laughs> we, I, put, we, I put it on a plate yeah. before we started recording and I feel that was very mean of me I feel it's been tempting us 
the whole time, but thank you very much. Thank you very go much for read, having me. No, go reading English Animals if you haven't read it already. It's absolutely brilliant.